Um, I believe now I'm going to give the floor to Doug Bowder, who's going to give us a song's decommissioning update. Uh, Doug, the floor is yours. Thank you, David. So in this section, we'll talk about the overall de Next slide, please. The overall decommissioning plan, just a brief look at the schedule. Our fuel transfer operations update, recall at last meeting, uh, Lou Bosch provided that update, and he'll provide that update here again uh, this evening. We'll talk a bit about environmental stewardship, one of our decommissioning principles. And regarding that, the, the permitting schedule, um, Ron Pontes will be talking to that, as well as our radiation monitoring reporting and how we're going to set that system up, and then environmental monitoring regarding public notifications. And that'll have to do with uh, planned discharges at the station. So we have some, I think, pretty good content teed up here. Uh, looking at the schedule, we've, we've actually shown this before, but now that we're through the uh, coastal development permit process, the meeting was on October 17th, we're gearing up to uh, put in place our required um, monitoring plans and our mitigation plans to start the D&D work. We anticipate the D&D work starting uh, in January or February of next year, and if you look in the middle there, you can see that major decommissioning work window, which extends seven to eight years um, starting in January or February of next year. Uh, we will have some overlap. We'll have overlap with the fuel transfer operation activities that will occur through the decommissioning work. We anticipated that. That was actually planned when we set up the decommissioning contract with Song's Decommissioning Solutions. And we'll, we'll be doing a, a lot of schedule reviews to make sure those activities are done safely in parallel. And I will tell you that when they are done in parallel, fuel transfer operations will always take priority. Next slide. I would like to introduce Lou. Lou was here at the last meeting, and he'll give us an update on the fuel transfer. Nope. Oh, there we go. Good. Okay. So welcome. So um, next slide, please. So the decommissioning principles, safety, stewardship, and engagement. I'm going to talk about these three. But before I do, I do want to point out our songscommunity.com has a really lot of good information of decommissioning and I encourage people to go to that. So I'm going to start with safety. As I said in the last CEP meeting, safety has always been my top priority. My commitment to the CEP members and the public is that the songs team will safely and compliantly transfer used nuclear fuel from the pool to the pad. With that said, the songs team continues to focus on safety. And when I talk about safety, I'm referring to industrial, nuclear, and radiological safety. For example, with regard to industrial safety, on November 17th, the songs employees, this includes all contractors and SCE employees, worked one million man hours without a serious injury. And a serious injury is an injury where medical treatment beyond first aid is required. Let me talk about stewardship. Songs has one of the largest decommissioning trust funds in the nation, which is fully funded. Every three years, Song goes in front of the California Public Utilities Commission to ensure SCE is spending the money prudently. And engagement. Songs engages the public in many different ways. For example, the CEP meeting that we're here at, social media. In addition, Songs facilitates plant tours where thousands of individuals each year tour the plant where we explain exactly what we are doing with regard to decommissioning. Next slide. So we're tracking fuel movement. So this is a diagram of the Holtec Isfasi. On this slide, you will see the latest status of pool to pad spent fuel transfer. The cylinders on the diagram show the canisters that have been safely downloaded. Since the restart of the Songs Pool to Pad campaign on July 15th, we have safely downloaded 11 canisters. There have been no canister hangups. We've had a few underload alarms where there was incidental contact between the multi-purpose canister and the divider shell. The crew responded correctly as they were trained. They stopped, realigned the canister, and safely completed the download. To date, Song has transferred 40 canisters with 37 fuel assemblies in each canister from wet to dry storage. Tonight, we will be transferring canister 41. We forecast to be complete the transfer of fuel, trans complete of transfer operations by mid-2020. Now, I do want to provide a personal observation 
I made two weeks ago in the middle of the night as part of the Songs Management Observation Program. I was on the ISFIS pad to observe the Holtec crew during stack up in the preparation for downloading of an MPC. I was on the headset with the crew so I could listen to the communication between the craft and supervision. I observed excellent command and control by the cast loading supervisor, good three-way communication between the members of the crew and, and procedure compliance. And it was getting around 5 a.m. and shift turnover was at 6 a.m. And the cast loading supervisor made the conservative decision to stop here and turn over to the oncoming crew. These are the type of behaviors that I'm looking for. Next slide. So the pool pad transfer summary. As I previously stated, we achieved a major milestone of a million work hours without a serious injury. So the question is, how do we accomplish this? So to start with, every meeting at song starts with a safety moment. Furthermore, every time a worker writes a safety action request, the worker gets a follow-up from our safety specialist to ensure we address the employee concerns. The entire station continues to look out for one another and coach as appropriate when the wrong behaviors are observed. So a low threshold for the corrective action program, key to the success of the fuel transfer operations. We have made it very easy for the craft to simply write a comment card on any issue that they have. At the end of the shift, all comment cards are then entered into our corrective action program to be resolved. Every morning, the plant screening committee goes through every action request and assigns appropriate corrective actions to each and every problem. Early identification of issues and prompt resolution. This is a project, and we will have issues. The early identification ensures that we will find and fix our problems, and I will discuss some of these issues on the next slide. And schedule pressure is not an issue. Overall, we continue to make improvements to the process through worker engagement and oversight. And I'm pleased to see the continued focus on safety over schedule, which includes stopping work to ensure our actions are correct and make process improvements. Next slide. Okay, so I'm going to talk about these challenges that we had. And I want to point, I want to point out this picture right here and what you're looking at. So if you look at the, it's a transfer cask, and inside of the transfer cask is the 37 fuel assemblies. On top of the, of the, the high track, there is a shield cone. And if you look really closely, you see a slight tilt to the left on the shield cone. So this was noticed by a Holtec employee that the shield cone seemed to be slightly tilted. A conservative decision was made and work was stopped. The high track was returned to the cast washdown area and upon further inspection, it was discovered that approximately a quarter inch gap existed on one side of the MPC. The MPC was subsequently modified, which eliminated the quarter inch gap and the MPC was successfully do downloaded in the ISFC. This was a clear example of a good questioning attitude by our craft personnel. The next one is vertical cast transport diesel exhaust fumes. So a Holtec worker identified a concern that in some wind conditions, diesel exhaust fumes from the VCT could affect workers in close proximity. Again, we wrote an AR, placed the issue into our corrective action process, and Holtec took timely action to have the VCT vendor access the problem and resolve the concern by modifying the VCT exhaust design. They basically raised the exhaust up. This was an immediate feedback to the whole tech workers. And the next two, the vertical cast transfer where tower height sensor cable failed and the unit two cast train speed sensor broken bolt, both of these issues uh, were discovered during pre-inspection walkdowns. These, these issues were entered into our corrective action process and repaired. Next slide. So a status summary, no safety, excuse me, no serious safety or human performance issues. Continued good teamwork between craft and whole tech supervision and whole tech supervision and SCE oversight. We have a healthy discussion between whole tech and ourselves on a daily basis to come to the right decisions. And a healthy and effective relationship between whole tech and SCE, some of the issues that Dr. Victor was talking about. We, Southern California Edison, are the licensee. Holtec is our contractor, 
and we continue to have a healthy and effective relationship. As an example, on November 5th, SCE held a five-hour executive oversight board to review Holtec performance. The Holtec executives flew out to California, and we concluded that Holtec is performing well with one canister a week. And continuous improvement actions are in progress. Workers continue to fill observation cards, which get entered into a corrective action process, procedure enhancement ARs to continue to improve our process. So in summary, the revised Holtec loading procedures, the new equipment, load shackles and cameras, and the training to Holtec and SCE oversight is working well. Safety and compliance continues to be the SONGS team's top priorities, followed closely with workers having a low threshold for writing ARs and placing them into our corrective action program. So this is, uh, I'm finished with my presentation. I'm waiting any questions Great, that you guys have. Thank you, have. Ted Quinn. Yeah, um, this is Ted Quinn. Yeah. Um, Lou, the question is, when, before you started the re restarted, um, you presented a chart of 13 people that was the new team as opposed to the old team. And I'd like some feedback on lessons learned on how that 13 crew and the procedures and programs that go with it worked. Is that the right number? Do you, do you have it set right now? Yes, so that is the right number. And, um, and it's just proven by the fact that um, as the procedures got revised, the downloading is going smoothly, the people are out there, we have the proper amount of oversight. I think you remember during the, the, the initial event, there were two people out there, we now have the right amount of people. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yes. Jerry? Just, just one quick question. Jerry uh, we are heading into uh, a period of inclement weather, and how will that affect the fuel transfer? Okay, so there's certain um, acceptance criteria that we use when we're, we're moving fuel. If it rains a certain uh, amount or the wind is at a certain um, threshold, then we stop fuel movement So out there. Very simple. I have a couple questions, but let me see if anybody else has. Uh, help us understand. I've got three questions. First one is about turn crew turnover. Help us understand where you are with that. That was identified as a significant factor uh, leading up to the events of August um, 2018. Where are you now? So there's very minimal fuel turnover, so we're not seeing that at all. And what's happened? I, it, it's a long project. The contracts are out there. They, they, they're, they're contractors and they want to work for a period of time, so it's a, we figure it's going to be till mid-2020 and they're, and they're staying. Okay, great. Well, it's nice to have them in the community. Yep. Um, incidental contact, you mentioned that um, you've had a couple of these underload alarms and incidental contact. Incidental contact is what led to the monitoring program that was required prior to, to restart of the fuel transfer operations. Are you expecting that in some of these cases that there will be a need for additional monitoring? Is there a threshold above which then you have to go monitor with the robots, the canisters, or help us understand what the plan is there? Okay. So just to give you an idea, each fully loaded canister weighs 103,000 pounds. We set our underload alarm at 15,000 pounds. So we had alarms, a few alarms, anywhere in the range from 15,000 to 40,000. What we do is we write an AR for every one of these and we put it into our long-term aging management plan, but there is no plan to immediately go out there and take a look at the, these that did have the incidental contact. But so, so the model that would then drive as part of the aging management plan, program, so this is the aging management is, is defense in depth. It's the idea that you have long-term system for monitoring and then responding to what you see. You might raise the probability of doing inspections on those canisters if there were more incidental contact as part of the download. Right, that would all be part of the aging management plan. Okay, last question from me is, when do you guys expect you'll be done? Mid-2020. Okay. I know that seems like a range, uh, David, but we're looking at the schedule closely with Holtec. As Lou indicated, we're successfully and safely downloading canisters about once per week, and they are not working on Sundays, and they are not working lots of times on Saturdays if it involves having the canister not in a position to directly download it. And this gets to the heart of one of your questions around crew turnover. We have a very stable workforce because they have a very stable schedule. Okay. Great. Th any other questions before we move on? Okay. Great. Thank you very much.